I am very pleased today to present the seventh lecture of our Umprum Architecture Lecture Series Summer 2021. In this pilot semester, we present successful and progressive studios, architects, artists, and educators from New York, London, Miami, Boston, Bratislava, and Berlin, which are actively connected to academic research, computational discourse, applied ecological architecture, fashion design, and art fusion to medium of music. I'm also happy and pleased with our gender ratio speakers, 50 to 50 percent. Uh, today, uh, we, have, we have Andrew Keel, uh, and was planned that uh, our rector of Umbrum, Ingrid Vibiral, will join, uh, join us, uh, but unfortunately, uh, today he is not able to connect to internet, so he wrote the letter, and he sent us a letter, so I have pleasure to uh, read his, his uh, notice. Ingrid is his saying, uh, or writing, about 30 years ago, when I first met Andrew Keel, he has been introduced to me as an American, American living in Prague, teaching English. Back then, we were all enjoying a specific feeling of freedom, which was permitting in the atmosphere of post-revolution in Czechoslovakia. Together, we have spent many joyous time in local bars and traveling as well. Of course, I was aware that Andrew is an architect who gained his education on prestigious universities such as University of Virginia or Princeton, but then has never been the main reason of our friendship. Nevertheless, I must say that I will never forget his commentary on a villa by Czech architect Jan Kotera, which we have passed by in Vinohrady one day, uh, or Andy's translation of my first essay, which was then published in English. In 1993, Andrew left Prague for a job in a studio of Josef P. Klaus in Berlin. Since 1999, he has been working in Sauber Hutton Company, where he has been collaborating on a series of great projects. Personally, I have seen the building of Federal Environment Agency in Dessau, which we have visited with my students from Umprum on a foreign excursion. I must admit, I was feeling very proud that the chief designer of that building is my good friend. And he's an expert in designing sustainable large-scale architecture. Apart from that, Andy is a great admirer of Czech avant-garde period between the two world wars and, and has a remarkable collection of Czech modern typography. It makes me very happy to say that such an inspirational and interesting person will be cooperating with our school. So that's message from Ingrid Vibiral. Thank you, Ingrid, for that. And now, Andrew, uh, the podium is yours. Okay, thanks very much, Imro. I just need to get my complicated setup done and then I can start first the right screen and then the, um, oops, then the right setting. Can you see ecological thinking, ecological attitude yeah. as an yeah. image? Okay, yeah. great. Okay. Super, and yeah, thanks a lot for the introduction. And um, I'd like to spend about an hour to speak with you all about the idea of ecological thinking and uh, an ecological attitude towards planning and construction. My talk leans on a sort of soft manifesto on ecological thinking that Alison Smithson in a text called With Green in Mind uh, described during a lecture in Buffalo, New York in 1991. In this lecture, Alison Smithson named seven aspects of ecological thinking in the work of the Smithson's practice. The lecture tonight is divided into three parts, and I think we'll manage them all tonight, at least I hope. <laughs> uh, part one, where I talk about two architects, the Smithsons, and two pavilions that they designed. Part two, where we see how three projects by the Smithsons exemplify Alison Smithson's seven aspects of ecological thinking. 
and part three, where we discuss behavioral and instrumental change as contemporary aspects of ecological thinking in architecture and bring ecological thinking to 2021. Um, and we update in this part, these seven aspects to deal with architecture in our time, where in a period of global heating, ecological thinking is urgently needed more urgently than ever. So to start out with, um, here you can see the two architects that I'm going to be talking about, or the next slide actually. Um, that's Alison or Peter on the left and Alison Smithson on the right. Um, you may never have heard of the Smithsons, uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about them. Alison and Peter Smithson were English architects who started their practice in 1949. Here you can see both of them wearing something silver. What amazes me about the Smithsons is their persistence, the way they continually develop the idea of ecological attitude through time, and the way this intense interest or perhaps obsession reflects in their work. In discussing their buildings, I will emphasize persistent themes in their design thinking, which I think have a great deal of relevance to the creation of sustainable architecture today. I'll start out with a short introduction to their work and impact on architectural theory. The Smithson's first realized project was the Hunstanton School, planned and built between 1949 and 1954, that you can see here. Um, this is a view of the interior. The building employs a very, very reduced means of construction. There's almost no cladding. I mean, the only layers of cladding are the paint um, that are on these different sections. Um, all installations, materials, and their fixings are, are also visible. Peter Smithson himself called it Mies van der Rohe with English steel sections, and Rainer Bannum called it the New Brutalism. The Smithsons themselves were active in the CIAM, that's the International Congresses of Architecture that were founded by Le Corbusier and uh, Gideon. And in the ninth CIAM conference of 1953, they joined a group of architects that criticized the Charter of Athens, this modernist um, urbanism uh, approach as being doctrinaire. Um, that's Alison Smithson in the foreground of this photo to the left taken in September, 1959 at the CIM Congress in Otterloo, where the, the organization was dissolved. One year later, the Smithsons and other criti critics of the Athens Charter met again in France and founded Team 10, uh, where they continued to meet, a group which they continued to meet with until 1981. Despite having dissolved CIAM, the Smithsons were obsessed with the idea of comparing their work with the work of previous generations seeing themselves as a third generation of modern architects. In 1965, the Smithsons published the heroic period of modern architecture as a tribute to the first so-called grandfather generation of architects that included, as you can see in the image, um, Le Corbusier and Mies van der Rohe. When the Smithsons started practicing, housing was booming in England. There were 250,000 units a year being built in the 1950s around 400,000 units on average in the 1960s. So there was this huge production and the Smithsons felt they needed to develop a theoretical approach to housing. And they used the pavilion projects that I'll be talking about these two pavilions almost as experiments. In 1956, the exhibition, This Is Tomorrow opened at the Whitechapel Gallery and included the Smithsons first pavilion project, which you can see the back of it here. Um, Completed by the Smithsons and artists Nigel Henderson and Eduardo Paolozzi, this pavilion was the beginning of what Alison Smithson later termed ecological thinking in their work. The exhibit, which you can see here, featured a light structure with walls made out of secondhand wood slats, the roof in corrugated plastic, the perimeter of the exhibition space was surrounded by semi-reflective aluminum panels. And the Smithsons called these aluminum panels um, along the exhibit periphery, a layer of fiction. The aluminum faced plywood reflected the surroundings, what was beyond and oneself. These reflections or layers dragged the viewer into a world of fiction, into an ambiguous future. It was like looking into and entering a kind of mysterious mirror, leaving out the relics of the world outside symbolized by the found objects placed on the corrugated roof of the pavilion. There was no direct collaboration between Henderson, Paolozzi, and the Smithsons regarding either structure or artwork. The Smithsons designed and built the structure, then they boarded a flight to a CIAM conference in Dubrovnik, 
And then the artists came along and inhabited the shed. The group refused the idea of an integration of the arts and architecture and as a statement worked independently of each other. They even called themselves the independent group. In terms of the shed itself, note the use of industrial materials, plastics and aluminum, and the careful detailing of the apparently random wood slats, which are actually symmetrical if you compare the two sides. The structural frame is left uncladded, and the art of, in of inhabitation, as the Smiths called it, how users interact with their buildings, is demonstrated in the found objects installed by Palozzi and Henderson. For the Smithsons, this pavilion and patio project explored the idea of a symbolic habitat, as they called it, a habitat reduced to a minimum, a kind of minimum dwelling responding to the basic human needs of a view to the sky, a piece of ground, privacy, the presence of nature, extension and control, and mobility. For the Smithsons, the patio and pavilion project was also the beginning of a response to climate a response that sought to enhance the quality of life and protect the house from the disadvantageous effects of a northern island climate. The English climate house begun in the following year demonstrates the Smithsons' intention to consider climate and how they position the building so that users can appreciate the seasons. But the reception of the project indicates some degree of misunderstanding. Kenneth Frampton termed the pavilion an ironic reinterpretation of Logier's primitive hut but within a decayed and ravaged, bombed out urban fabric. Kenneth Frampton's account was in fact incorrect because if you read the text here on the screen, there was no television set um, involved in the exhibition. And it was based in fact on Rainer's, Rainer Bannum's account of the project because Kenneth Frampton never saw it. And Rainer Bannum wrote his account in The New Brutalism, which emphasized the idea of the pavilion as an ironic response to a war damaged London, consumer society, and so forth. But as Nicola Petzelet has pointed out, the Smithsons would seem to have been more concerned with another precedent. In calling the Shedder Pavilion, the Smithsons seem to invite comparison to Mies van der Rohe's Barcelona Pavilion, which was actually a very permanent, permanently constructed building for a temporary pavilion um, built, for the, built for eternity. Um, the other famous pavilion that um, Petzlet compares the Smithsons Pavilion to or says that the Smithsons are setting themselves in relation to uh, would be Le Corbusier's Pavilion de Tons, des Tons Nouveau. And the, the aluminum frame surrounding the Smithsons Pavilion resembles the rectangular structure surrounding Le Corbusier's source, the primitive temple in Versailles Architecture from 1923. But whereas Le Corbusier emphasizes geometry in his writing about and discussion of these temporary buildings, the Smithsons emphasize and defend the fragmentary, mobile, and participatory aspects of their pavilion as a concept for future habitation. Logier's concept of the primitive hut, that the structural form should embody the natural and the intrinsic and reflect natural processes, seems, however, to have, have had a lasting impact on the Smithsons theory especially the inference from the famous frontispiece that the origins of structure and architecture can be traced to simple pavilions or huts with columns made out of trees. The idea of the shed and of the primitive hut persists and recurs in the Smithson's writings. In 1984, in her article, The Grown and the Build, The Landscape That Can Survive and the Leverance Connection, Alison Smithson wrote, trees, columns, roofs, the lean-to sheds that signal a pause before the entrance into Leverance's chapel at the Malmo Cemetery, which you can see on the left, here seem as Piero della Francesca's nativity shed built. That, that you can see on the right, a painting uh, from 1475. So obviously, Alison Smithson was collecting a lot of images of, of different kinds of sheds. And the Loger reference can also be seen in Alison Smithson's further reflections on Sigurd Leverance. She wrote, Leverance extended his inherited neoclassical language toward what we might call the trees that become buildings. That was a lecture that she also gave in 1991. For Alison Smithson, Leverance extended the aesthetic of the forest clearing. Our interest in Leverance is in his inventing in the chapel at Woodland Cemetery, a language that we might call the grown and the built, a grove of column trees truncated, some still growing, some become building. And she wouldn't let go. <laughs> she followed the idea even further of the tree and the column uh, and saw 
uh, and, and cited the Italian, what she called the Italian connection for the column as tree. Um, that's uh, the column as tree trunk being Vermontis column in the Cortile of Sant'Ambrogio. So one actually actively sought out examples of, of columns as trees with this idea of architecture and nature somehow being uh, intrinsically linked. And further compounding the idea, um, Alice and Smithson cited the general interest in tree trunks in the period that Leverance um, designed his chapel at Woodland Cemetery, um, citing Munch or Kandinsky, uh, Egon Schiele, Mondrian's cherry trees. Um, and concerning Egon Schiele's painting, she compared the atmosphere that's made visible in the pink color um, it seems to go backwards and forwards um, to a connection backwards and forwards in space and how one generation of architects extends the work of previous generations in a similar way. So there's also this kind of real fascination with generations. But to con continue with the idea of the tree, it's maybe no accident that in their next pavilion, um, this one for Wayland Young, the Smithsons integrated a tree and an existing garden wall connecting them with a lean-to roof, this kind of angle roof you can see, um, above to a new pavilion structure, which is in the photograph on the left there, you just see the block walls basically. And the interesting thing about the block walls is that they're left untreated. There's no plaster on them, just like the, the brick wall to the right. And that was an idea about um, with materiality um, and also with the way that the rooms sound and feel uh, and look to mark difference between path and place. Um, so you definitely know just by the way you could be walking through there blindfolded um, and you would still kind of know where you were from the acoustic of, of the space. Um, and this all done with extremely minimal means. Um, here the perspective sketch gives an overview of the project. You can see that on the right. It's basically a um, mid-size house um, in the center of London. Uh, with a garden in the back and um, another house behind it, the garden filled with trees. Um, and to get an idea of where this actually is, I included these views from Google Maps um, to indicate the project's central London location bordering Kensington Palace Gardens on Bayswater Road. So the pavilion, which is, as you can see uh, here, unfortunately, with now without a tree, <laughs> it apparently didn't survive. Um, provides a visual uh, protection from the street and also a kind of noise protection through this garden wall. So the idea of protection uh, starts to evolve in this project, uh, noise protection and um, environmental protection. And within the courtyard, the pavilion itself also dissolves the barrier between its own interior and the patio space of the courtyard um, with these sliding panels that can be fully, fully opened in both rooms um, making the pavilion a kind of covered extension of the patio, almost like an alcove. And the pool uh, that you can see here in the, in the foreground, it basically adjoins the interior directly and provides, uh, by doing that, evaporative cooling in the summer. So the garden and the pavilion itself are, are in this kind of intense interaction. Um, and actually, one takes a stair that you can see here to descend into the garden patio from the main house. So you get this kind of effect of um, descent through this descent, descending as well um, through different layers of temperature, because obviously in this patio atmosphere of the court, there is going to be cooler. Um, and so there's also this, this idea of um, a kind of layering of uh, atmospheric temperature change. So very sensitive architects. And with these two pavilions, the patio and pavilion exhibit and the Wayland Young Pavilion, the Smithsons started to sketch out the core themes that they developed in their housing projects from the 1960s onwards. And this is actually where the title of the lecture um, comes from because uh, in this lecture that Alison Smithson gave in 1991 in Buffalo, New York, called Green in Mind, she described what she called seven aspects of ecological thinking in the work of the Smithsons. So the first aspect was this idea of the creation of acoustic privacy. That's why I emphasize the protective aspects of this garden wall at Wayland Young, the dissolution of the barrier between inside and outside, which you could also see at Wayland Young, the way that the building interacts with the courtyard, including the sky and the building's territory, response to aspect and prospect, that's basically the view, and also how the building is viewed from the out outside of it, um, and also to the local microclimate or any kinds of microclimates that might be relating to different parts of the site that the building is on, this kind of descent into this, these lower temperatures of the courtyard. A respect for topography, 
acting as newcomers to a place, studying its history of occupation, as the, the Smithsons called it, its patterns of use and understanding the effect of seasons and allowing for a sense of territory and a sense of privacy and thus broadening the, the basis of the art of inhabitation. And my argument is that basically these seven points really influenced what they made as architects, how they planned, how they designed buildings. Um, and uh, for, to, to show that, I've basically chosen three of the projects that um, Alice and Smithson used to demonstrate these uh, seven aspects of uh, ecological thinking. I mean, I think she had a list of about 30 projects. I don't know how she made the lecture. <laughs> she must have, I think for each point, she had seven projects. Um, but of course, she knew them much better than I do. I'm going to try to make an attempt to sort of show what I see in, in these projects as being uh, especially fascinating. So we'll start out with the idea of protection from noise and establishing a sense of territory of number one and number seven of the seven points, um, both of which are really well illustrated by Robin Hood Gardens in London. And I'm showing this image at, to, at the beginning to give you a sense of the scale of the project. This is a photo montage that the Smithsons did. They worked, um, they were, they worked frequently with the, with photo montages to give an idea of the scale of their buildings within the urban, um, general urban setting. And the argument about this site was that uh, Victorian England, as you can see here in these maps, and the the red bit up in the upper middle of the map here, that shows the size of the site of Robin Hill Gardens. They were arguing that as London grew, especially um, with these huge infrastructural projects um, that came out in the Victorian period, um, that this kind of development needed to be reflected and taken up by other building typologies, particularly housing, in order to provide an appropriate response to the change scale of the urban fabric. So the idea being you couldn't continue to build like this with these tiny blocks, with these one to two story houses, when you had these enormous infrastructure projects as neighbors, something had to change in the overall scale of building, which I find a really interesting way of, of, of looking at uh, um, a project that you start from way back and then uh, you will see how they focused on the most minute details of this building. Um, but they always started out with the urbanism, um, urbanism as an aspect, and as well with the sort of um, sociology about knowable areas, which is actually a pretty much common sense thing. I mean, this drawing here on the left shows uh, a radius of a half of a mile, which is the equivalent of a 10 minute walk. And that's what the Smithsons called knowable areas. And the idea was that three of their projects could basically form a neighborhood, um, a neighborhood where people knew each other, where there were different levels of association. That's another aspect of their thinking. Um, and uh, even at this kind of mid-scale, they, they were conceptualizing um, their projects. And going a bit more into detail, and besides being about the appropriate urban scale of the project, or this one, um, is the result of an obsessive research into how to provide protection, protection from noise. Um, and here you can see in this sectional perspective, um, this kind of raised earth, um, uh, this kind of hill in the courtyard. And that was basically made as the Smithsons explained in the film they did for the BBC in 1970. They built this kind of uh, hilly landscape in the middle to prevent people from playing football uh, or doing other noisy activities in the courtyard and encourage a quiet and peaceful atmosphere and basically to um, set it over for uh, children uh, that might play there. So the, here you can see on the right that the football ground itself, there is one but it's sunken into the ground on the north of the site with these kind of sound absorbing walls. Um, so there was this real focus on how to create as quiet an atmosphere as possible within this courtyard. Um, the reason for that is to create a contrast to this incredibly loud exterior all around the building, which was surrounded by two major transportation arteries on both sides. So both of these long sort of wings of the building um, have these highways going um, to central London and from central London on the sides of them. And this gives you an idea of how loud that would have been, especially in the 1970s before um, cars got a bit quieter in streets as well. So incredibly noisy environment. Um, and to mitigate that noise um, coming from the roads, the Smithsons decided to build this kind of, uh, this unfortunate precast <laughs> wall, uh, which you can see here. And 
I think that's the most unfortunate aspect of the project, even though they perforated it in different ways and made these details about different kinds of cuttings into the wall to kind of open it up a bit. It still is associated, I think, with things like penitentiaries. I mean, that's the first association I think most people would have, especially due to this kind of angling on top. But it did provide the noise association. I think that they probably wanted to try plant more trees, at least the section indicates that uh, it could be a kind of continuous row of trees. And there's a sperm of grass. Um, the cars itself on the site are kind of sunken into a moat. Um, so they did everything that they could basically to reduce um, the effects of noise from automobiles. They also, um, in terms of the, um, well, here's a moat um, as an example. I mean, the, this business actually cited the idea of a moat uh, giving buildings a, a sense of um, territory. Uh, and that was another reason to build a moat essentially uh, in this project. Um, and here you can see in the section, um, what was happening along the outer facades toward the streets. Essentially these facades um, were uh, basically the way into the apartments. Um, this business foresaw this idea of streets in the sky that uh, would be able to uh, be like kind of pedestrian roads or paths that uh, would allow access to the apartments. And all of the louder functions like living rooms, um, these paths themselves are on the sides of the streets, whereas the bedrooms then were oriented uh, toward the courtyard. And here you can see this, this kind of raised street and uh, the wall um, along the outside of the building um, and the sunken cars in the moat. Um, and basically this section shows um, this idea of basically keeping the living rooms on the louder side and the bedrooms um, and kitchens, interestingly enough, um, oriented toward the park. The kitchens were oriented toward the courtyard um, and provided with views into the courtyard for the protection basically of the children playing there that they were, were always able to be watched and, and taken care of. Um, so there's this real consciousness about the idea of protection in every single possible way, not just sound protection, emissions protection, um, but also the protection of those living there. Um, and here you can see um, these children playing then on the mass of these the earthen mounds uh, in the park. And then the, the, the fenestration providing um, a kind of possibility to um, make sure that nothing happens in this park, kind of surveillance. And the facades um, that were oriented, the street itself, um, took up the theme of protection of, uh, from noise again. Um, they employed these um, sort of absorbers for the tilting windows. So when the window tilted, it was open on top, but on the bottom closed uh, in order to prevent loud noise from the street from entering into the space. Um, and then there are these kind of deep vertical pillars. This is a construction um, a from a film during the construction of the, of the site. And these vertical concrete I-beams um, were basically there to abate the noise, reduce the noise um, between apartments. Um, and at the same time, uh, they marked as well the kind of boundaries between apartments. And the facade in this way kind of formed this protective layer and it addressed what Peter Smithson called a pressing need for the protection from a glut of noise, movement, and things. Um, an instinctive move, as he called it, in the 1970s, um, to, because uh, it, was a, it was a really pressing problem at that time. And um, here you can see the, the facade toward the courtyard. Um, and to quote Peter Smithson again on the facade, he said in the Robin Hood gardens, the problem of acoustics between rooms, floors and the outside and inside required the use of a large scale lattice. That's this kind of grid structure that you can see here. There's basically every apartment is kind of marked with a sort of uh, wall and a secondary construction in front of the facade. Um, and he said that this will prevent and mitigate the propagation of sound basically between apartments. This lattice he wrote could be seen as being a protective layer and a layer of identification demarking the extent of ownership of each domestic space. So there's the beginning of this idea of conceiving a building as being made up of layers uh, or lattices uh, on facades. But by, 1915, uh, by 2015, uh, Robin Hood Gardens stood in the shadow of Canary Wharf, which you can see um, behind here, um, which is uh, here almost kind of attacking or encroaching upon the site to gobble it up. Um, but this image does at least give a strong sense of the idea of protection and identification this building provided its residents. Um, 
until, of course, its demolition in 2018. Um, and currently, um, replacement buildings are under construction with an enormous density compared to the Robin Hood Gardens, if you kind of compare these boxes with their enormous depth uh, to Robin Hood Gardens with these very thin uh, apartment walls. It's just basically coming from two completely different standpoints. Um, and this protective shows, uh, perspective shows um, buildings that basically could be anywhere um, in the world uh, and also nowhere. It would be worthwhile to take time to compare this project with the Smithsons, um, but I think it's, um, I don't know, <laughs> uh, it's not something that I would necessarily want to spend too much time on. But the thing is, if you look at the Smithsons project, you really um, can understand the sensibility that they showed to the site and compared to this project, it's a complete insensibility to site conditions. Um, I mean, the fenestration of this building shows that um, sound protection and orientation played little role in the design <clears throat> and the inelegant massing, these kind of big clumps of the buildings makes mechanical air handling and air conditioning pretty much mandatory. <clears throat> so this is definitely not the kind of way that uh, we wanna go. And I think that one could learn quite a bit from what the Smithsons, depending upon if you like their aesthetic, um, but uh, you know, how they approached uh, architectural issues and how they kind of tried to, to make out of these issues um, form. And I think that's the most fascinating aspect. And with the second project that I'll talk about, um, basically here we can discuss the ideas of dissolution of inside and outside, the difference between the two um, and the inclusion of the sky. Um, somewhat the respect for the ground, enjoyment of the seasons and a sense of territory and all these aspects are really well demonstrated by a project that the Smithsons did for Axel Bruckhäuser, um, the owner of the Tecto factories, um, company making chairs basically and furniture. Um, this building that you can see is uh, in, in the second and third images located in Bad Karlshafen um, in, in Germany. And um, here, the dissolution between inside and outside is planned into this existing building. This is kind of, uh, in German, they call it a Fachwerkhaus. Um, uh, and this dissolution is uh, reached or achieved by these uh, glazed porches and, and bridges that allow views in all directions from inside out, from outside in. Um, these kind of punctuations and these in-between spaces are basically an expression of this idea of this dissolution, um, or one could even say celebration between, or making visible um, this realm between inside and out. And here the existing building with its additions from the Smithsons in the summertime, and here in fall. And of course, seasonal change in this landscape can be immediately sensed. Uh, it's a forest, of course, but perception of this is enhanced by an architectural element, this uh, lookout porch on the left, which is connected to the main house by a bridge and allows the person sitting here to kind of enjoy this experience of the seasons that uh, is made visible by this blanket of leaves that, that covers the roof. And so there's, there's a real sensual approach uh, to, to architecture and it all has to do with vision and framing views basically and creating vantage points to experience um, the seasons in this case. Um, and here, some images to emphasize that the frame view is what allows us actually to perceive the dissolution between inside and outside in the way that the Smithsons are talking about. And this lattice um, that kind of helps to form these frame views um, and that form the structure of framing a view from the buffer spaces here between the inside of the building and the outside um, and toward the landscape. That's all part of the development of the idea of the lattice um, in the Smithson's work, which started as fixed lattices that appeared like as filters, veils, membranes, um, or protective skins, um, kind of weaved surfaces, flat surfaces, um, which developed in their later work um, where these lattices began to separate, become more permeable, um, and created intermediate spaces um, to be occupied, as you can see here, again, by this idea of the art of inhabitation that basically started with the patio and pavilion project um, that the Smithsons did that I showed at the, at, right at the beginning of the lecture. And that they really kind of finish up with this project um, that emphasizes this kind of three dimensionality um, of the lattice. Uh, here, you can see just through the angles and all that, how the space starts to collapse or become more three dimensional. And so they 
started to play with this kind of surreal aspect that could be um, shown through these viewing windows, um, kind of a, in a way as a, a critique of a kind of sort of more classical way of framing views toward the landscapes. Um, and here you can see the view of the lattices from the outside. And so they also have a very strong uh, impact on the, the appearance of the building. Um, and the lattice itself joins or connects with the idea of this diagonal brace um, that the Smithsons also have um, developed. And you can see it also in the project of the Hexen House and uh, for Axel Rukweiser. Um, and they kind of weave both of these themes into this project. But this brace is basically a demonstration of the Smithsons persistent return to the idea of generations indicated by this sketch done by Peter Smithson where he shows um, the history, as he calls it, of the diagonal brace over three generations. On the top, Mies van der Rohe's sketch for a glass house on a slope. In the center, Eames' uh, black wire chairs with a bird. <laughs> and below, um, the Lucas building, which they did for Tecta in 1973, and then three generations. So there's this kind of continual, continual return to what previous architects did, the ideas that they were developing, um, and also framed by this concept of, of these generations. They also talked about Renaissance architecture in this way. Um, and there's also, with this theme, theme of lattice, um, the idea that maybe it's also more related to Gottfried Semper, who in 1851 distinguished this idea of the membrane of a kind of textile enclosure as a primary architectural archetype. Um, he did this after studying the Caribbean hut, um, which he saw at the Great Exhibition of 1851 in Paxton's Crystal Palace. And it may have been actually that, uh, you know, the glass facade of this palace um, essentially dissolved any kind of sense of a difference or of a layer between inside and outside. And, I, and some people think that, uh, that this was the reason why um, he kind of took up on this Caribbean hut and emphasized the idea that the membrane itself kind of coats and protects the cor corporality of the, of the structure. Um, and if you contrast this as well to the image of the primitive hut we saw earlier, um, against this kind of model uh, of the primitive hut where structural form follows natural laws, um, as Logier proposed, Semper suggested that form would emerge um, rather from the textile surface that covers the structure, not from the structural frame. Uh, and I think that this also sort of weaved itself into the idea of the lattice as, this, as the Smithsons developed it. Um, anyhow, um, now for something completely different. <laughs> uh, the Smithsons called this third project um, and the third pavilion that we'll be seeing today, the upper lawn, I just shortened it here, upper lawn solar folly, I wrote, but I actually called it the upper lawn solar pavilion and then in parentheses, uh, a folly. Um, and I suppose most of you know what a folly is. It's uh, in the English landscape gardens, a kind of view catcher, something that structures a view or hides something uh, behind it. It's a kind of means um, that was used in English landscape gardens. And usually these buildings had either no function or what looked like a temple was actually a water pump. Um, and so there was this sort of uh, this, this difference between what the building looked like and what it actually was. Uh, in this case, not. Um, I mean, the Smithsons use this upper lawn pavilion as a kind of retreat, a place in the countryside, but also it was for them an experiment uh, in passive solar gains. Um, they wanted basically to see what it would mean for the temperatures, of the temperatures within this building if they basically just completed uh, or made the facade completely out of glass. Um, so it was sort of an experimental project, but it also, and here the classical view with the Citroën DS in the foreground, um, they, they were also fascinated by another aspect of the site that I'll get into in more detail later, which, for which this window and the view from this window is, is very important. Um, the building itself has a timber construction, most of which the Smithsons built themselves. And here, the building clad in aluminum when finished in 1962. And it would appear to be a kind of condensation of all the previous pavilions that the Smithsons made. I mean, if you think about the patio and and pavilion or the uh, Wayland Young pavilion, this almost seems to kind of compact them and, and condense all, all the things that we saw up until now. Like for example, the, the sliding and folding doors completely opening on the, the ground floor um, as at Wayland Young or the timber construction 
and even the aluminium uh, at this is tomorrow reversed and, and uses a, a kind of a cladding. So it's now the other way around. It's not containing a space and you look at it, it's actually enclosing a space and, and it's reflecting toward the outside. And then if you note also the use of as found elements, the walls uh, that are existing here inside or the, the paving um, and the contrasting treated and untreated surface here, the stone wall left alone and here um, basically coated with plaster. Um, and uh, here another view toward the, um, the timber construction. Oops, I'm going backwards, sorry. <laughs> um, but for Alison Smithson, perhaps the most important aspect uh, of the project was its view to Fonthill Abbey, um, which was built by William Beckford between 1800 and 1813. Here you can see the sketch, it's really hard to read, that's why I had to write it in red, Be Beckford's Abbey Ruin, um, which is a building that Alison Smithson visited frequently as a child and she kind of had this magical relationship, you could call it, um, to this uh, ruin and to the entire site. Um, and here you can see the Smithson's photograph for publication um, through that important window that I showed at the beginning um, that kind of with these two fields. Um, and this is the window that's directed uh, directly toward Beckford's or the Fonthill Abbey that uh, was in this plan sketch. Um, and here you can see the relationship between Upper Lawn and Fonthill Abbey in Google Maps, they're very close. And um, they were once part of a, of a huge complex uh, called the Fonthill Estate that was owned by Beckford. I mean, essentially this is all part of a large English landscape garden um, with, of course, functional uses, fields, et cetera, but also um, a kind of a landscape gardening effect as well. Um, and you can kind of get the sense of this relationship, this Fonthill House, um, and here you can see the house, the Fonthill Abbey, which uh, Beckford built in the situation that it was in 1801. Um, the tower in the middle, this is basically a capping because uh, Beckford tried to build a tower. It was 91 meters high, but it collapsed um, after he built it. And this is a kind of temporary capping of it. Here you can see the tower um, in 1807, um, which was then 90 meters high. Um, and of course, this one unfortunately collapsed as well. And here, the final version in 1813, this 137 meter tower for a private house for an individual. Um, the costs for the final tower alone were at that time 273,000 pounds, which is 87 million pounds today. And here you can see Fontill Abbey in an image by uh, Turner at around 1800. And, this building was basically called the largest folly in England, um, the largest garden folly. And I think that's probably why uh, Turner kind of painted it as such in this um, almost this landscape that almost reminds one of landscapes of ruins. Luckily for Beckford, who by then was heavily indebted, um, he sold the building in 1822 for 330,000 pounds, which is today 150 million. So he didn't lose too much uh, to a weapon dealer. And three years later, in 1825, the tower collapsed for the third and last time. So um, the building that the Smithsons were looking at or the remains have a really fascinating history um, with this obsessed person that maybe thought about Lincoln Cathedral being the world's tallest building that collapsed uh, in 1548, uh, um, but it was basically the world's tallest for 200 years in, in England. Perhaps Beckford was thinking as well of Hereford Cathedral, here seen in ruins in 1788, a bit closer um, in its location, about 100 miles from Font Fonthill Abbey. Um, and here, what remains today, um, basically uh, just this small portion of the original uh, huge complex. Here, a section the way it once was. So the tower, and maybe that's one of the reasons why it collapsed, was made out of um, wood sections, timber sections, that was co that were coated with stone um, coping all around uh, the facade of the building, um, and it just basically couldn't survive, I guess, um, in terms of its scale, which you can see here. This is an image of the so-called Great Western Hall. This is the ruin today. That's the image that we just saw. And here's the Great Western Hall. And just to get an idea of the scale of this hall, and as well, perhaps this, an idea of the scale of the, a 137 meter high tower in a, a private dwelling, um, this image could help with that. Um, and it didn't escape, of course, the Smithsons um, that this building was a folly. Alison Smithson wrote herself 
that when they were building Upper Lawn, Upper Lawn was located on what was originally William Beckford's land at a time when it could be seen as sheer folly to spend all we had on building something for ourselves, that's the Smithsons. Um, but the act was one of deliberate commitment for the siding was deliberate for Beckford had built England's greatest folly, which I think is a hilarious sentence. Um, it's ironic, but not, it's really funny. Um, and here, um, a sentence uh, by Beckford himself that Alison Smithson quoted in a book on Upper Lawn as a kind of verbal illustration. And she wrote, um, I have been haunted all night with rural ideas of England. The fresh smell of my pines at Font Hill seemed wafted to me in my dreams, the bleeding of my sheep and blowing of my herds in the deep valley of Lawn, of, uh, lawn Farm barely sounded in my ears. So this is Beckford writing about the kind of central experience um, of uh, being uh, at Upper Lawn or being uh, at Font Hill Estate. Um, and Alison quoted this as a kind of way to understand what she felt perhaps there. Um, she was really fascinated by Beckford and her interest in St. Jerome. She wrote a book uh, called St. Jerome, The Desert, The Study, um, may have been sparked by Beckford, who actually owned the 1500 um, Conegliano painting of St. Jerome that you can see to the right, which is uh, now at the National Gallery in London. And it's actually right next to this painting, so it couldn't have escaped the notice of Alison Smithson um, that uh, Beckford was also, also had an interest in St. Jerome. And when Alison Smithson actually went to Upper Lawn, um, she did it to, in order to write and um, to, to, um, to retreat from, from London. Um, and she called this Jeroming. So uh, she said, I'm going to Upper Lawn to Jerome, which meant for her to, to kind of escape from uh, and, and to, to find recluse uh, in, in this, uh, in, in this uh, kind of protected environment. And at the same time, um, she also projected herself deep into the history of the site. I mean, if you think about this view uh, from Beckford's bedroom, uh, this is a chromolithograph from 1815, and <clears throat> see the way that Alison Smithson projected. I mean, on the right-hand side here, I have to explain this to you. This is a photo montage that Alison Smithson made, and you can hardly see it here in red on the lower left, but she inserted Upper Lawn Pavilion that the Smithsons designed into this uh, image from 1815 of the building as if it could be kind of seen then in a kind of a projection forward into history. Um, so she really uh, was, was fascinated and by the site and, um, and, and embedding herself into it and wrote, uh, whether in an urban setting or in nature, all creativity relies on being cocooned and such a sense of in, um, inviolability relies on its fragment of functional space being with an enclave encapsulated in its turn within a protective territory. And, and so here you really get this idea of, of again, protection, um, but also restoration um, in, in the sense that uh, by, by rebuilding um, this uh, upper lawn or by adding this, um, this pavilion, this folly, and establishing these views and these connections that it's somehow a restorative action, um, historically speaking. And going back to the room with a view, um, and we can have a kind of more closer look at these uh, furnishings. And they start to remind us um, then of another pavilion, that of Charles and Ray Eames, architects of the second generation, as the Smithsons called it, of modernist here, um, the, the pavilion in the uh, Pacific Palisades in California. Um, and here in the view of the interior, I'd like to kind of draw your attention to the candlesticks and to the ladder and to the fact that most of the objects in this room are on the ground. And if you compare the way that the Smithsons um, uh, choreographed or the sonography that they made for photographs of their own upper lawn pavilion, this is a view um, of the ground floor of upper lawn, um, you can see that even though, of course, the American project of the Eames um, is obviously has a very different um, aesthetic and uh, construction and belongs obviously to another continent. There are these kind of elements that weave it to, or bring it together uh, with the Smithsons. Um, and I think a way that the Smithsons were very, very consciously did uh, in, in creating this photograph, they were, they were constantly trying to establish connections in very subtle ways. Um, 
But in fact, the plaster thick walls and the fragmentary nature of the Smithsons furnishings actually remind one, remind me personally, um, of the image um, of the shell that fits uh, man's back uh, that's included in Ordinarius uh, and Light, uh, a book they did, <clears throat> uh, they published in 1970. Um, this is a Slovak uh, peasant cottage that they're, that they're showing here. And it's this sort of fragmentary nature of the furnishings, of course, the ladder and the plaster and the simplicity, reduction of means of it all that kind of, I think, fascinated the, the Smithsons as an approach to um, housing projects. Um, here, the plan section of uh, Upper Lawn, and you can see these existing walls, basically, that they built upon in the stones here. Uh, making pavement patterns here, the ladder that we just saw in the image. Um, and the idea of this existing wall and structure and the new one completely integrating itself um, uh, with uh, not so much attention actually to the way that they meet. Um, it's almost, it's always very abrupt uh, kind of connections. Uh, and uh, respect for the ground indicated, uh, as you can see here, not only in retaining the found elements like the stone wall and integrating them, but in the pavement that's composed of stone and brick found on site. Um, and it's all arranged in the size um, according to the specific new use of the various spaces in the garden. Um, and here the resulting rich composition of materiality um, really centrally appreciable. Um, and uh, here one could almost say that this image perfectly emphasizes the idea of uh, or illustrates the idea of enjoyment of the seasons uh, in their work. So summarizing um, the 17, uh, the, sorry, the seven aspects of ecological attitude, um, it can be said, uh, it can, can be said that um, to have accomplished the design, oh, sorry, summarizing the seven aspects of ecological attitude can be said to have accompanied the design process of these buildings as a kind of principle of association informing each architectural decision. So um, by thinking about the ideas of protection, um, in this case from noise, um, the result is all of these different um, aspects of architecture from the smallest detail to the actual way the building is placed on its site. Um, all of these um, results are basically from this initial idea or intention and it's the same basically with all seven of these points. Um, however, I would posit that the seven aspects of ecological thinking um, broached by the Smithsons could be updated and actually in light of what's been happening since 1991, the last 30 years um, since Alice and Smithson had her lecture, um, they really do need to be updated if, we're, if, if we could start to think about um, using this as a kind of basis, um, the idea of ecological thinking as a basis um, to think about sustainability in architecture today. Um, and I would also argue that's the reason why I call it, um, call this part the way that I do, um, that these updated aspects might form part of a new definition of progress. Um, and that's actually a quote from the Czech architect Ladislav Žák, uh, whose work I'll show at the very end, um, he built very few buildings and um, unfortunately designed very few landscapes, uh, but they're very evocative, um, the ones that he did do, and he had some brilliant ideas, um, which I think are really relevant um, today. Speaking of the idea of generations uh, of architects and learning from what architects did in the past, even the recent past. And today, when we speak about sustainable architecture, carbon emissions is basically the main theme. We hear about carbon all the time. So here's a sketch basically of how seven aspects um, of ecological thinking here above the, the ones that Alison Smithson um, mentioned. And below, um, I'm kind of indicating how they might be rethought today or reloaded, if you will, today, especially in terms of current goals in reducing carbon emissions. And since Alison Smithson held her lecture on ecological thinking with Green in mind in Buffalo 30 years ago, um, technology and design thinking have developed and resulted in buildings that produce energy, sequester carbon, with an architectural response that communicates and extend, extends these technological developments. Basically, the seven orange aspects in the lower row are a kind of condensation of these developments. Um, I think as I've seen them basically in the, the work of our own office. 
Um, and they would be my suggestion for expanding the scope of the seven aspects of ecological thinking um, as uh, formulated by the Smithsons. But before detailing that, I'd like to speak a bit about the predicament that we're really in. As of April 2021, a substantial gap remains between the projected levels of emissions in 2030 and the lower levels that would be consistent um, with the temperature limit of one and a half degrees emphasized by the Paris Agreement. And here you can see we're talking about 20 to 24 gigatons of uh, carbon emissions that we're not, uh, that we would need to actually reduce within the next 10 years, or actually now we've only got nine, uh, in order to meet those targets, which is um, to here just a number, but to give an idea of what that number means, um, we can look to um, some other people that have uh, taken time to calculate it. Um, and the, the thing is that architects and engineers have taken carbon into their agendas and lectures worldwide today. And our own work at Sauberkatten is an example of this. Um, but others are also doing all they can to find and communicate an approach to sustainable design. And here, um, with uh, Werner Sobeck, uh, for example, um, we can see 17 theses regarding sustainability in construction. And Mr. Sobeck poses the question basically of how we can feasibly and realistically reduce CO2 emissions. Sobeck in his theses and his discussion of them um, mentions sequestering through tree planting. It's basically you plant trees, they absorb carbon um, and you can kind of balance out the, the carbon emissions. Um, he mentions this as a possible solution, but the amount of trees, he calculates it, the amount of trees that would be needed to, uh, or need to be planted to sequester our current CO2 emissions is just unrealistic. Um, I mean, essentially the current world forest cover is 40 million kilometers, 30 million kilometers of additional forest according to his calculations, which is 20% of the total land area of the world, equal to the area of Russia, China, and India, would be needed to sequester the 32 gigatons of carbon man-made emissions that are currently, that we are currently producing every year. Um, so obviously, although it's important uh, to sequester CO2, to plant new forests and to use timber and construction as much as possible, um, it's not gonna be enough. And the task at hand for architects will have to be um, a drastic reduction in resource depletion by using renewable building materials like wood, um, energy consumption in terms of uh, the way that they design the technical aspects of buildings with the engineers involved, and carbon emissions uh, in building construction. We basically have to have a drastic reduction. And there's two ways to achieve these ambitious goals, a reduction in demand on the one hand, basically building less um, or using less materials, um, or an increase in efficiency on the other hand in the use of all resources. Um, so these are two methods of um, basically achieving our goals. Um, and these two options, um, they basically have an effect in terms of our experience because they mean on the one hand, reduction of demand would mean for each individual uh, in behavioral change um, and increase in efficiency means instrumental change that we have to get used to um, new technologies um, and innovations, uh, which is also a, a big issue. Um, and we basically could decide to live as Diogenes did and reject comfort and consumption, embrace the raw elements. We wouldn't even need to go as far as Diogenes actually went. Uh, we could simply forego air travel, eat locally grown food, use a bicycle, accept high summer temperatures in schools and offices, et cetera. And that would probably be the simplest, cheapest, and, fast, and, and maybe fastest way to achieve our targets, but it would probably bring our economies to a halt. Or the other advantages, the other, the other approach would be my barrel is my iPhone. Um, so we could use instrumental change, uh, which would mean letting technology do the job for us. The idea being that technology can offer us the best of both worlds. Um, now, many aspects of energy consumption and resource use in cities are already being addressed by instrumental change or technological innovation. Every urban process is becoming increasingly optimized and every component made more economical. And at best, these processes 
are already controlled by automated systems. So human intervention would no longer prevent the systems from performing to specification. And today in all of our work, reduction of energy use through timber construction and reuse, building simulations, clim climate design, life cycle analysis and cradle to cradle, they're all the new normal. This is a kind of standard practice nowadays. And abstinence today means avoiding demolition and reusing existing buildings. If new construction is still necessary, then it should be timber construction. And we have a new baseline for sustainable construction based on quantifiable building performance in terms of energy use and carbon emissions, but we can still achieve lower emissions by trying even harder. In this case, reuse of existing buildings and renewable energies proved to be the deciding quantifiable, quantifiable factors in further reducing primary energy consumption and the resultant carbon emissions for this project in Hamburg that we designed. But although it is correct that many ecological aspects of buildings are quantifiable and that the success of sustainable planning is to some degree measurable, in the assessment of what is sustainable, there still remains a large area that is not measurable which is left up to the subjective judgment of individuals. So beyond quantities, the quality of life offered by the built environment can only be measured by our own personal sensory apparatus. Sustainable architecture, therefore, has to address and stimulate the senses of its users. Indeed, the primary element in this understanding of what sustainable architecture might be is bodily perception, what can, which can also open the way to an understanding of ecological concepts. We shouldn't just ask ourselves what sustainability looks like, but what it sounds like, feels like, and smells like. And this kind of approach, I think we've seen in these seven projects that we've talked about. It's what Alison Smithson called ecological thinking and ecological attitude. And it's what we, in another uh, essay um, by Matthias Sauber, um, call what does sustainability look like. And in updating Alison Smithson's seven aspects for the urgent situation that we're in today, uh, and now I'm going back to the um, diagram that I showed uh, at the beginning of the third part, we could take the following position as a new manifesto for ecological thinking. That one, protection from noise, um, as you can see on the upper left, could be extended to a more general protection from emissions. Um, be that sound emissions or fumes, um, chemicals from building materials or carbon emissions. Um, the Smithson's idea of dissolution of inside and out could be extended to describe more clearly the architectural response, the creation of in-between spaces that link interior and exterior and provide flexibility of use according to the season. So buffer spaces that aren't heated um, but still provide a roof over one's head, porches, uh, et cetera, that one thinks about architecture not as being a kind of constant requirement for a number of square meters, but as a changing requirement that, that adjusts according to the seasons um, in order to reduce costs using less heated space in the winter, for example. This is an uh, idea that um, the British already employed in the 1600s in the creation of country houses, so it's nothing new. Um, the inclusion of the sky could also be expanded to include an inclusion of all natural elements on the site and increasing the sensual awareness on the part of the user to the geology of the site's plot of land and other natural quali qualities that provide um, a sensual kind of simula uh, stimulation, be it the particular smell of a place or of materials, its sound or the acoustic quality, um, the feel of the surfaces, texture, all these aspects are just as important and just as important to include in considerations. Acceptance of the sun, the Smithson's idea of this kind of passive solar experiment at Upper Lawn should be extended to the extent that we think of buildings themselves as the source of their own energy, made of renewable solar-grown materials like timber. Respect for the ground um, could and should be elaborated into the kind of respect that would favor reduction of means over new extraction of materials, reducing and reusing as design materials. Enjoyment of the seasons in a period of global heating where we don't know what the next seasons um, are going to be like, or we can expect that they will be different from the way that they are now. Um, this would need to be reformulated as resilience, um, creating resilience in our buildings and, and projects and understanding climate change um, 
and um, what's happening and taking that into consideration. And finally, a sense of territory. Um, and I think this is the most important aspect. Um, it means um, the restorative and regenerative design of habitable landscapes. And all of these factors beg for an appropriate means of communication through architecture. And in this project, I'm showing the environmental agency in Dessau project that we completed um, in 2005. I think this shows in some ways how these seven um, approaches that I just discussed um, and the, the updated approaches, how they uh, are illustrated in, in a building project. Um, we issued a drawing on the right, which coincidentally, as you can see, has um, seven aspects of ecological thinking as well, but these are not the same seven that I was just speaking about um, and how they were realized in this building. Um, and the aspects have to do with building volume, geometry, the technical systems. Um, and the idea of this diagram though, is to emphasize how all of these aspects um, and these kind of ingredients, if you will, or these ideas, um, how they were all integrated uh, into the architecture, how they kind of make a complete system um, and how the architecture has something to do with that system and, and enables it to kind of work as, as a kind of organism. Um, and that's a, a really important aspect uh, to, to thinking about um, these uh, lists of points that you often see in, in guidelines on sustainability that they, that they shouldn't exist necessarily alone and for themselves, but they're part of a kind of overall approach. Um, and in this project, uh, the, the side that you see on the left um, here, protection of noise and protection of emissions was a theme uh, because the facade is constructed of a triple layer timber facade construction that absorbs noise. It actually is able to kind of move um, and absorbs noise from the surrounding streets and rail. And the movement on the outside is not transferred to the inside. So the sound basically just um, stops on the outer surface of the timber facade. Um, there's low chemical emission project, uh, products used on the interior fit out. Um, all the emissions of, uh, of every project, a product used in the project were um, analyzed uh, by, by experts. Um, and the overall concept um, of the building aimed at reducing primary energy use and thus uh, CO2 emissions. And here, this idea of these buffer spaces, um, the dissolution of inside and out, the inclusion of the sky um, is, really, is really exemplified by this atrium space, which although it's not heated, it's always six to 10 degrees warmer in winter than the outside temperature. It provides shade in the summer through this um, sun shading on the glass roof. It allows for internal connections um, between the office spaces and also in sort of um, in, in meeting rooms that um, are, have, employ a temperature gradient. Um, so you're ba basically able to use more area with this building depending upon the season at hand. Um, they use it now in the spring, summer and fall as uh, meeting spaces in the time of Corona because they have to have more air volume in order to become, in order to, in order to um, comply with uh, regulations. Um, so these, these buffer spaces are important for many different reasons. Um, but I'd like to also draw your attention to the architectural expression, which in form of the color used to, to shade and, and mark, this is a kind of color print, uh, dot matrix print, which provides shading, um, but a kind of soft sort of shading to the offices inside. And it also marks um, the operable windows and through the color itself, it emphasizes this outdoor green quality of this atrium space uh, with materials as well that use various degrees of uh, roughness or smoothness in order to increase the kind of sensual experience. The sound is also, I think, one of the most interesting parts of this atrium space because um, not only are the slats, the spaces behind the slats um, foreseen with the kind of insulation material that absorbs sounds at higher frequencies, um, but the low frequency sounds are also absorbed by these glass um, elements, which have a layer of insulation and a very thin layer of aluminum behind them. And those absorb deep frequencies. Um, and that basically enables um, the user of this building to have anything from an important uh, an informal chat um, going on in this, in this space to a small concert. Um, and by the way, the atrium roof is um, fitted with integrated photovoltaic 
panels uh, and this uh, for this uh, solar panels on the rest of the roofing surface of so the building also produces its own energy. Um, the reuse of existing buildings and building materials was practiced to as great extent as possible. This brick wall employing um, bricks that were part of the original wall and here it was basically um, rebuilt with the existing bricks or here the factory which was completely um, saved and it was one of the few buildings that could be saved. There were some other factories on the site but they were contaminated and this was one of the only ones besides um, the one you see here to the left that could actually be retained. Um, this is now a library and here it's an administration um, building with exhibition and office space. Uh, and we also um, used recycled concrete in the building as much as possible. So this idea of the reuse of existing buildings and materials um, was an important aspect of the design. But the building accepts the weather as well and weathering, anticipating it in the design, for example, with its timber facade, which is enlarged and turns gray with time. Um, and the building program was also broken up into separate buildings. The cafeteria to the left, um, this is kind of its own garden folly building, if you will, um, meaning that one needs to experience the weather by walking to, um, to get to it. Or the auditorium here in the middle, which is barely visible in white, it's kind of like a cast stone pebble um, in the center, accessible from within the atrium or also from the garden. And the existing disused factory building here, you can see um, to the left is basically left as a ruin um, in, the, in the landscape. And all of these um, follies, uh, even including the air intake um, shafts that you can see here done in Corten style steel, um, all these follies basically allow for an enhanced perception and do through the placement of the buildings, um, an enhanced enjoyment of the seasons for the users of, of, of the building. And here you can see the park landscape, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. And the facades themselves respect the ground, um, the ground being the kind of context um, and the neighboring buildings by either picking up their colors. Here you can see there are various colors that are all red. Um, some of them are uh, beige and, and yellow and, and whatnot. And our facade picks up the colors um, of these uh, existing buildings or of the landscape in order to kind of um, reinforce uh, the spaces uh, between uh, the buildings. Um, here you can see actually a film uh, that we made. I hope it works. It does. I hope you can see it. Um, in order to kind of study the kinetic effect of the facade, the effect that the changing colors have as you walk along it. Um, and I'd like to point out here that although the building is indeed large and has 800 individual offices, one can never perceive it um, in a single view, which means the building always appears to be smaller than it actually is. Um, and that's due to its form and um, its interaction with the adjacent landscape in the buildings. Um, so because it's curved, basically, the perception of the building is always a kind of a limited one, which uh, I think is also important considering the size of this building and this, the relative scale of its of its neighbors. So I'll stop the film now um, and go on to the next slide. Um, but the sense of territory really plays a defining role in the project as Dessau forms, the city of Dessau, which you can see here, forms a part of the Gartenreich, this kind of huge park, the Gartenreich Dessau Wurlitz. Uh, it's an English garden and it really is huge. It's uh, 14,000 hectares of land. Um, it's one of the largest landscape parks in the world. Um, and designed, of course, in the English landscape garden tradition, um, the park was also used for plantings and grazing of cows and such. So it belongs to this history um, that started in Great Britain. And Humphrey Repton, um, one of the inventors of the English garden concept, um, conceived of his gardens as improvements on existing landscapes. Um, the improvements coming from either the emphasis or the suppression of details. And so you can hear, see this flap here, this shows the existing situation in this park. And when you take this, when you flip the flap away, you can see uh, Repton's intention, how he intended to improve it by creating a garden folly, this temple on a hill, and foreseeing plantings that hide uh, the street um, so that one doesn't notice that it's actually part of a, a, a a larger general landscape uh, that one has the impression that the property extends uh, in, into, into the horizon um, and other rows of trees that hide other paths that are used for uh, labor. Um, 
So the, here I had the idea of that I was talking about the idea of repairing landscape, um, uh, restoring landscape, and uh, we have this as found park on the left of our industrial site, which uh, essentially was a brownfield site, lots of factory buildings, and this is the one factory building that we saved that I showed in the slides uh, before, and uh, here's this kind of administrative building that I was showing, and the rest of um, the site was covered with industrial buildings. They were all contaminated. We had to basically remove six meters of earth uh, from the site, and so there was anyway the necessity of um, bringing new uh, earth uh, works in, into, the, into the site, and uh, we saw this as kind of a project of repair. Um, and you can see here how um, the new building is uh, also surrounded by a, a garden to one side, um, which links um, these existing parks. Um, and so this is taking up on Humphrey Repton's idea of repair of, of landscape. Um, and just as much as the agency attains um, this sense of territory and creates a kind of habitable landscape, um, this aspect of ecological thinking also um, figures into other projects we have done as well. Um, for example, at the Emanuel Kirche or church in Cologne, which you can see here, a building uh, constructed almost entirely out of timber. And here you can see the site model, and this would be the facade of the church that we just saw, and this uh, kind of uh, green piazza um, in front of the church, that's actually composed as a, uh, to be an outdoor church, as you can see, here, so <clears throat> that which happens inside the building can also be extended in warmer months um, to the outside of the building. And, um, and this is this idea of um, a kind of functionality that, that can be extended into the landscape, a kind of real habitable landscape where you take real functions of buildings and allow them to, to, to happen outdoors. Um, and here the interior of the building, as you can see, clad completely in, or without any cladding, uh, just built completely in timber. So the sense of territory and the idea of, idea of habitable landscapes means, um, as I've just shown, this kind of, also this idea of regenerative and restorative design. Um, and the idea of the habitable, land, habitable landscape was discussed by Ladislav Jacques um, in his book, Obitna Kraina, um, which he wrote in 1947. And this diagram comes from that book, it's on the last page, uh, it's from 1944. Um, and the idea of uh, this is that behavioral and instrumental change, even automated instrumental change, um, they were already addressed uh, by Ladislav Schack in his uh, new definition of uh, progress uh, on the last page of um, Obitna Kraina. And Diogenes Barrel, which you can see here, um, which, is, uh, which has the expression uh, uh, which means liberation, um, this kind of liberation, if it's combined with this barrel, can only mean um, the kind of liberation that comes from abstinence or consuming less, uh, as Diogenes did, because Diogenes himself argued um, that lowering consumption uh, means liberation. And I think this is a really fascinating diagram. I mean, it's so old, uh, but it's so forward thinking. It's just incredible. Um, I mean, here the idea of automated machines that, that you know, Parazzi uh, Samuccini Stroyu that he could think about that in 1944, that there are machines that are kind of, you know, uh, basically automated completely, that allow um, so much free time that um, one can attain a higher degree of, of culture and understanding of nature, um, and that it all has a kind of a cyclical meaning, uh, and the cycl cyclical meaning would result in, in this kind of creation of a habitable landscape. I think it's uh, incredible, and the book should be required reading for all architects. It's, it's an amazing book. Um, and this is the only park that uh, Jacques did. Um, and I'll kind of do an English translation of what we just saw. Um, and I think it works well with this image that uh, Jacques envisioned a future habitable, la habitable landscape where the work of automatic machines, which maybe is our internet of things, would enable leisure time, material and mental culture, human perfection, healing, calming, internalization and freedom in a liberated, saved, restored, and newly created world of renaturalized inhabitable landscapes. Um, and here, the only realized version of that kind of landscape, um, the memorial site at Le Jacques. Uh, this is one of the few projects that uh, Jacques realized after the Second World War. <clears throat> and in 19, 
so it means this in 1944 that Vladislav Jacques was already um, where we are today, where we've arrived today um, in our understanding of sustainability and design, because restorative design means a reversal to pre-development environmental conditions, which is one of the main themes of Jacques' book, Obitna Kraina, where he argues that um, cities have to return to a more naturalized state uh, where we get rid of fences and, and uh, roads and um, kind of smaller single family houses and other junk in the landscape and re-naturalize it. There's, there's many images of this uh, in this book. Um, and also the idea of regenerative design where human and natural systems are actively co-evolving as one. Um, and that's perfectly illustrated by Jacques' new definition of progress as a kind of cyclical process. So this man was really ahead of his time. Um, and here the development in terms of concepts and certifications and guidelines. So you can see that there's a movement nowadays from sustainable design toward restorative and regenerative design. And uh, here you can see the different sorts of uh, certifications or um, ideas uh, that have been developed over the last years and the directions that it's moving in. So it's really moving in the direction of, um, of uh, Ladislav Jacques. Um, but the most important aspect with all of these um, aspects that you can see here um, projected um, are getting into the details and understanding what a passive house is, how it works, what biophilia means, what rewilding means, and, and really trying to take them uh, into projects because we need to make decisions as designers based on knowledge um, and dig into the technical aspects um, that are behind building practice um, and retaining an appropriate judgment. Um, in order to develop our own approach um, to sustainable, restorative, and regenerative design. So thanks very much. I'm finally finished. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, in the final, you are pretty fast. With the language. Yeah. You can uh, play it back. <laughs> but sorry, yeah. I need to be slower, yeah. No, no, I think you were pretty fast, but uh, you jumped to the end very, very unexpectedly. So, but your approach and combining Sauerbruchatten and Ladislav Jack uh, we, uh, put me back to my, to my uh, roots of interest uh, decades, two decades ago when I, uh, uh, when I did my exhibition landscape, which was the, which was the try of combining the, my architecture observation with uh, observation of the landscape. That time when I travel around the world, I, I was uh, looking to the architecture, but not just to the architecture, but al also to the environment and to the landscape. And I also, also combine that time, my project, my competition project to that observation with the landscape. And that's fascinating me that time. And that time, first time I started to, to uh, try to design kind of amorphic landscape, countryside, kind of uh, fusion of the architecture with the, with the topography and the landscape and, and, and the greenery. And this is exactly what you were talking today about. Uh, and, so, uh, and, and it's uh, interesting point for me to my uh, uh, way of observation. When I first saw Sauerbrunn lecture, at AI conference in Berlin, uh, I was obsessed by the interest with the colors, how they turn architecture, uh, how they turn our uh, attention of architecture to kind of aesthetic and, and human aspects. I was talking about my interest of observing, of observing, observing yes. and creating architecture through observing the landscape, countryside. I did uh, 20 years ago, the, the traveling uh, exhibition landscapes and that, uh, that uh, exhibition compare my, my projects, which were very uh, uh, inspired by the landscape and countryside, and my photos of my traveling through the world, and and I try to design kind of soft 
uh, and uh, like topographical architecture. And then, and then next experience, which is also very common with your talk, is the uh, Sauerbruch-Hatton experience. When I first time I saw a lecture at AIA conference in Berlin, I was so obsessed by the observation of how they look to the architecture and they were talking about the colors, about the human point, how to, not about technical aspect, not about tectonic construction, etc. but was very interesting po point for them, how to put the human aspect of the color to, to the facade and to the uh, architecture. So Ladislav Jacques, uh, how to look to the architecture and to landscape and Sauer Burhatten, there are four interesting points for me, which are, which I'm close to, um, to, uh, to your, Mm, talk. Yeah, I mean, it, the, it's really um, also important to think about structure and and to uh, and it, it's a, it occupies a large portion of my time. Uh, for, you know, these kind of details um, that are very technical. Um, looking at um, plans from the structural engineer, for example, um, there's a kind of a, a bunch of we, in German we call it Schwarzbrot, the kind of black bread, <laughs> the sort of you know tough work that every architect is in, involved with, which is um, dealing with quantities, costs, et cetera. Um, and I think that the danger uh, and the reason why we express um, this kind of human aspect um, is that we really sense the danger um, when you're really focused on all these technical aspects, the danger of losing sight of the human aspect um, that we're actually creating. I mean, everything that we create is used by human beings. and and is sensed by human beings. And it's really important to kind of continually remind ourselves um, of that aspect um, because otherwise you can lose it. You can become just completely technically oriented. It's really easy um, to, to lose this kind of sensitivity. Um, and I think that, that I can understand, you know, uh, through your experience um, of observing landscapes, um, how that also makes one aware um, that it's, uh, that it's important not to lose sight of the effect of a building in its landscape and the other way around how buildings and landscapes interact. So, Before we uh, go to uh, some people who are, uh, uh, want to ask you, uh, I think the, 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 it's time now to change because now the architecture is understood, understood as through the observation of machines, of technology, how technology understands the architecture. Now we have to go back to how humans, how we as a, as a human uh, living persons observing the space and the environment and our neighborhood, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and also how we create it in our own minds, you know, because that, that's actually the funny thing I noticed about using computers with architecture, because I've been using them since I started working um, at architectural offices uh, in the 1990s. Um, and the interesting thing is um, that now that we're doing designs in three dimensions with, uh, say, Revit or other programs and starting to use BIM as an approach to architecture, um, that I think increases, I would say, the, the kind of removal in a way um, of uh, the mind and, and the kind of uh, the work of the mind to understand a building in three dimensions from the actual project and the way that it's represented because Revit makes it so easy in a way um, to kind of see things at different angles. But we can hear you now. I don't know what's going on with the image. That's strange. Uh, and <laughs> Sorry. Never mind. Anyhow, um, no, I was, as I was saying, I, I think that there's, um, there's this kind of certain risk um, in using these technologies that um, one doesn't take the time and the effort to kind of reconstruct a building in three dimensions in one's own mind by sketching it, you know? I mean, there's a, uh, I, I think that Wilhelm Flusser, for example, who's also a Czech, uh, he uh, basically um, argues about this idea of gesture in technology. Um, and I think that the idea of the gesture is really important in terms of um, understanding um, how machines work and how interactions of humans work with machines. And the gesture is basically when we take a mouse and draw something, um, uh, make a mechanical image as Flusser um, called it. Um, and if we make this kind of mechanical image by hand as a drawing um, and really work out, um, for example, through drawing in the heights, dimensions, et cetera, what a, a space looks like by hand, 
it sort of enters our mind and we're able to think with it. Um, when we basically, um, you know, uh, outsource that kind of idea to the computer, then I have the sense that somehow, um, that somehow we uh, lose um, a kind of three-dimensional understanding of things. But that's just my own sort of uh, suspicion. <laughs> uh, I don't know what your experience on that has been um, in, in teaching. Um, have you noticed the kind of similar sort of thing? Maybe I didn't notice that there's a lot of symptoms of your. Did you, did you hear what I just said, or was something missing? The, the, the end was interrupted, interrupted for me. The, the, I think you, you asked about the teaching experience of. of We, we are incredibly unlucky with the technology today. Um, yeah, I have no idea. This has never happened to me before. It's <laughs> never been this, this bad. I, I have no idea what's going on. I, I, I've got a suggestion, though. Fresh, fresh faces, maybe try to go to another people with the questions. <laughs> uh, I've got a suggestion. We've got a question uh, posted on Facebook. Uh, people are watching us live on Facebook as well. So is it okay, Andrew, if I if I read the uh, the Facebook question aloud? Certainly, yes. Okay. So the question is from uh, Marketa Harehorova, and she says, uh, "Thank you for the wonderful lecture. Do you think ecological thinking and attitude that you have been describing could be taken a step further? Meaning, could architecture further help to elicit an ecological attitude in its inhabitants?" Yeah. Actually, I I hope that I would. Um make that a little bit clear in the in the lecture. I mean, that's actually the kind of driving force behind what we do. Um, and the way that we do it is essentially to um, encourage interaction um, with these technical elements. Um, I mean, I tried to show that with the windows, for example, at the agency that were colored. Um, I mean, those windows are just operable windows and relatively normal. Um, but there's other elements um, of the buildings that have a kind of function that's about something technological or um, something that has to do with sustainability. Um, and we basically approach it in a very uh, intense way in terms of the architectural studies that are behind these things. Like for example, the facade of the museum in Brandhorst, uh, the Brandhorst Museum in Munich, Germany, which is made out of ceramics. Um, these ceramics basically are in front of, it's like a layer in front of another layer that um, is sound absorbing. Now, um, one could have done this in a very banal kind of simple way, but the way that we did it with these ceramic elements and uh, in different colors and the way that we emphasize also this kind of kinetic aspect of that facade that the perception of the color changes depending upon your distance uh, and your, yeah, from the building or your approach to the building, it kind of invites people to take another look, to take a second look. Um, and the whole intention behind that is that when, the users of the buildings do take a closer look at what's behind this object, this beautiful object that they're using, they start to really appreciate it and identify with it. And um, in so doing, identify with the sustainable idea behind that object. Uh, I mean, that's, that's really the intention uh, behind our architecture and especially behind our use of color uh, in buildings is to kind of uh, uh, basically um, form an interest uh, in what's happening um, behind these these objects that uh, of daily use. Thank you. Um, we've got a question from uh, Veronica. Hello. Thank you for a very nice lecture. It was inspiring. Uh, I would like to I would like to ask. Maybe you could talk about a little more on uh, inclusiveness and achievability of materials and uh, building processes in uh, ecological thinking, as you described. I would maybe like to refer to using, um, maybe I will start from other way around. Uh, in many examples or many examples in um, ecological architecture, ecological thinking, thinking in general, 
uh, ecological is referred to be something very exclusive because the technologies and because the materials are more expensive right now, um, most of like many people or general public think it's something very exclusive. So bring, uh, bring the inclusiveness of ecological thinking, we need to uh, kind of be aware of what is going on, uh, be educated and also have better connection with the environment as you were describing and talking with Imro. So this is for me, very, very important thing to highlight, but I would like to ask you, especially when you were talking about timber constructions and using these materials, how, um, like, I was, I was just thinking, what if timber constructions would be used in a large scale and in many buildings that wouldn't be ecological anymore. So we need some sort of balance in order to bring, bring inclusiveness to ecological thinking. Maybe you can evolve more on that. Yeah, um, I mean, it's a, it's a really important question because it's the um, main aspect that we deal with every day in our work and that most architects deal with every day in, in their work. Um, and the problem and the reason that um, ecological architecture is um, a, seen as a luxury product uh, is because indeed, um, in many cases, it is more expensive. And that has not only to do um, with the price of wood construction or timber construction compared to concrete construction, it also has to do with the fact and especially has to do with the fact that um, that the carbon taxes uh, and that the price of carbon is so low. Um, I mean, all one would have to do would be to increase the price of carbon um, from 10 euros or 10 pounds to 100 euros or 100 pounds. And then clients would start to really understand that, um, that they um, have a vested interest in, in building um, sustainably. Of course, a step like that would increase the, the cost of construction generally. And I find that that's um, a huge problem because construction uh, and uh, new housing has gotten so expensive that it's out of the reach of most people. Um, and that's a problem that I think one can only address um, through a radical simplification of how we build, um, involving much less cladding materials, uh, involving visible technique that's um, you know, visibly attached to walls and kind of finding an aesthetic out of that. I mean, if you look at the work, for example, of uh, Ash architects, um, H and then architectos, or I know, sorry, architects, they're from uh, Barcelona. They have a lot of um, uh, new buildings, really interesting buildings that reduce um, the kind of uh, architecture that you see to raw materials. It's kind of like, in a way, a new brutalism um, where, you know, like the Smithson said at this Huntington School, where you can basically see every uh, piece of conduit and all that. Um, and that has to do with building inexpensively. And they also have lots of um, these kinds of in-between spaces in their buildings that don't, that aren't insulated um, and uh, that you can use only at certain times of the year, but you can use them. And, and so it's like, I think an approach like this um, that can take this kind of exclusivity out of um, a sustainable architecture. And of course, what you were talking about timber um, in terms of it being, um, at some point, no longer really sustainable. Um, I mean, I think the problem right now is that there's definitely a limit as to how much timber um, can be produced. For example, um, glue lamb timber, um, there's only a certain production cap capacity in the world. It's increasing um, exponentially, but it's still nowhere near um, what can be done or what can be produced in terms of traditional construction methods. And and that's, um, I think, an issue that we're seeing now reflected in um, enormous price changes in uh, timber. For example, um, we have projects that we're working on right now. They were bidded um, a year ago, and now the timber costs four times as much. And so the companies that are that bidded these projects, they have serious economic problems right now because they can't get the timber. The reason for that, that they can't get the timber is because these beetles and insects um, have destroyed a lot of the forests in North America, in the United States, that's due to global warming. So there's a huge shortage of timber right now in the United States, and the Americans are importing lots of timber suddenly from Europe, 
where this problem is just beginning. I think in the Czech Republic, you also have a problem with these um, uh, insects that kind of destroy the bark around the trees, um, especially uh, evergreen trees. Um, in Germany, it's a, it's a problem uh, which is really difficult to manage. And so um, this whole development is extremely complex. Um, and that's where I keep going back to Diogenes' barrel and say, let's just reuse what we have um, and try to make the most of less area um, and less materials in order to make building finally affordable and also really ecological. Is it okay to take one more question? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so Dan wants to ask a question. Hi, Dan, I can see you, you can't see me. <laughs> hey, uh, hello. Um, I had two, two points, I think. Um, one was uh, just an observation. Is it like, uh, I, I, I thought about it with a little bit of, uh, oh, first of all, uh, great, uh, great uh, lecture. Uh, I liked uh, getting uh, this whole ecologic side. Uh, it was kind of amazing uh, that you didn't mention any technology at all. It uh, just was simply uh, all about that. But is that sometimes some sort of uh, English uh, uh, feature that uh, you you mentioned the, like the first uh, of your uh, points was about a dike or a moat or is it like a, a you know these this uh, Wales moat and uh, all, all these English moats and uh, uh, stuff like that or, or is uh, it was it just a coincidence or sort of uh, like that and then uh, I had this uh, idea about uh, so, so you're talking about these follies and if uh, the follies back then uh, were some sort of like a, a perception or their idea of uh, like a medieval uh, structure so would uh, the people of today have some sort of like idea about the future and these today's pavilions that uh, are being constructed all over the world with uh, these universities and uh, other teams, would they be sort of like a, a mirroring uh, just uh, going into the future maybe, or um, is that? Uh, yeah, I understand your question, I think. Um, I mean, in terms of the first question, the moat, um, uh, that is a very uh, English, I guess. I mean, it, there, there were moats in, in Europe and in, in continental Europe as well. Um, but I, I think that what the Smithsons wanted to express with this idea of the moat is the idea of protection, you know? And I mean, in the medieval city, um, the city walls were the protection, you know? Um, and in the early, in the medieval city at around 1300, the towers were the protection because there you could see the invaders coming over the hillsides to um, attack your town. Um, so there's all these kinds of elements of protection involved and I and what interested me about the moat idea and this idea of protection was um, the fact that even in the 1970s Peter Smithson um, was thinking about the fact that humans still need protection not necessarily from invaders or armies or whatnot but from all the all the noise around them and all of the kind of um, advertisements uh, for products and consumption around them um, and I think that he kind of wanted to have architecture focus on this as one of many needs. Um, so, so much to the idea of moat and okay, I'll admit that I'm really into English architecture. I'm from the United States, but uh, I kind of am fascinated by the eccentricity of the British. <laughs> and uh, so I kind of sometimes get lost in it. It's really funny. But in terms of your second question um, about like a modern folly, um, and I assume that you meant like a folly in the sense that the Smithsons did, because um, their project was also, um, they called it a folly, but it was an experiment. Um, and they called it a, a folly ironically because um, I guess they thought it's an experiment that maybe people will laugh at uh, and not necessarily take seriously. And these kinds of um, follies, these experiments, um, they of course exist um, nowadays as well. There's architects, Baum, uh, uh, Baumschlager, Ebele, for example, they build an office for themselves, which one might call a kind of folly because um, it doesn't, I don't even think it has heating. Um, it's basically a building with incredibly thick walls um, with windowsills that collect water. 
And the building tries to be totally resilient, you know, to take resilience to its extreme by not using any energy at all. Um, it's their own office building. Um, and there's other kind of projects like this um, where architects go outside of the laws um, and try to build something outside of the law in, in the sense that you can't get a building permit for this kind of project if you're trying to build for someone else. An architect can only build it for themselves and try to find some way to build outside of the um, construction laws by calling um, a house, for example, a pavilion. That's also one kind of realistic approach, you know? I mean, there's projects like this around Berlin where uh, architects build houses also without heating that are really experimental and they call them something else so that it doesn't fall under the building laws. Um, so that's another aspect of this kind of idea of folly where I think that, um, you know, combining the idea of calling a building something other than what it really is allows one to experiment with uh, new forms of construction or architecture that may not yet be legal um, in, in a sense. I, I hope that that answers your question to some extent. <laughs> it's a bit of a complex answer. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, I guess it wasn't really a question in the true sense, you know, it was just like how to uh, expand on it. Yeah, Thanks. sure. It seems, like, uh, yeah. uh, it seems like it seems like Veronica wants to ask one more question. Is that okay? Of course. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I was wondering. Um, th this question is something I'm thinking about in a long term because I'm also interested in this way of thinking and bringing up ecological awareness more in depth. And I have a question: Is ecological is it still ecological? Because I, I think that there are two types of being ecological. One is uh, being really aware of what is going on. And uh, another thing, uh, another part of it has something to do with popular cult culture nowadays. Because uh, being ecological in a way, it is becoming part of uh, popular culture and lifestyle and and um, it is not really about the, the original meaning of it, if you know what I mean. So I was wondering where is this boundary and how to kind of diversify one from another? Diversify what from what? Um, um, like really um, what, what like being ecological what, in terms of how you were describing in your lecture to understand the problem in depth and to really understand where the problem is coming from. And then you, we have another sort of being ecological, which means like it, it's already part of popular cult culture. Um, okay, like green um, greenwashing. Are you talking about that? Yes, uh, yes. <laughs> and okay diversify and how to set this boundary for to educate people more on it yeah i mean i guess uh i guess i don't necessarily have too much against greenwashing in the in the sense that it um creates a kind of culture of thinking ecologically or at least uh, encouraging it and indicating that it's kind of accepted as a way of thinking and in terms of the original meaning of ecological, it comes from the Greek word uh, oikos, which means household. And it's kind of the logic of the household, if you will, or the kind of way to keep your house well. And understood more broadly, um, of course, the household of, of human beings is the earth. And so um, it's basically about keeping your house in order. You know, that's the kind of real sense of um, ecology and, uh, you know, I, I, at some point the word sustainable took over and I, I almost cannot hear it anymore. I'm so happy that there are these new terms that are starting to supplant sustainable as a, as a word um, because I find it um, difficult as an idea. I mean, if you think about sustainable, it means we can continue the way we are forever. And who really wants to do that? I mean, can't we change something? <laughs> and, and so, um, I find it just a, a kind of difficult word. And that's why I think that ecology is much more interesting because it's really about um, uh, keeping, uh, keeping your house uh, and taking care of your house in as best a way possible. Um, and yeah, I, I, I suppose that the only way to really get rid of greenwashing is to do things like what um, Werner Sobeck is doing, where he's trying to basically show 
through these studies of um, magnitudes and scales that the things that the greenwashers are telling us are just impossible and unrealistic. I mean, you can't have your cake and eat it too. And if one can bring these facts in a kind of easily understandable and visualizable way um, to people, then I think one can really help to improve the situation and start to draw the line that you're talking about between these two kinds of uh, ecological thinking and maybe one could call the other ecological advertising <laughs> or marketing. Um, I think that the, it's like with Corona, the more people are aware of um, the, the, the science, um, the, the, the better off, I hope that at some point we will all be. You know, it's a, it's a sort of increasing knowledge question. Thank you very much, very interesting. Thanks it's for your like great questions. <laughs> Sorry? Can I hear you? Uh, and you? Yes, no it's connection. okay now? Or? Yes, it is okay. At least I can hear you. So okay. maybe there is uh, some problem on Imro's side. But anyway, it seems like uh, what, what you said, the, the final sentences were uh, also really nice uh, final uh, words for after your lecture. Uh, if you think that this could be the, the wrapping up or maybe there are some more questions or maybe some, some comments that you would eventually like to make? I'm, I'm really happy to have uh, been involved in, in this uh, program. And I thought the questions were um, really fascinating. And uh, if anyone uh, has some other questions that might occur to them later, um, they could feel free to write me um, at the write an email to me um, at our office. I'll give um, uh, Imro and Jan uh, my email address in case anyone wants to get in contact afterwards. Um, but I'm really proud to have been a part of this um, discussion series that uh, uh, Imro and Jan have been organizing and uh, it's uh, a really fantastic thing. And I wish, uh, if this is the, the, um, the end of this, I, I wish all of you um, a good semester. I've heard it's been prolonged. <laughs> So it's a bit of a longer maybe one than usual, but um, as much success as possible and health as possible um, in the coming times. So thank you very thank much. You. We were very lucky for having you. It was a very valuable contribution. Uh, Imbo wants to. I think I would like to thank thank you thank to uh, Ingrid Viberal who who made that uh, connection possible. Uh, he. He put us to the contact, and I think this is not last connection, uh, maybe last virtual connection, and definitely we planning to uh, to invite you personally to the school, and we should continue on such a kind of uh, very um, uh, advanced uh, discussions. So this is not last opportunity. Thank you, Inge Viberal, but also thanks to our school supporting us for this pilot uh, uh, lecture series, which was uh, which was the first time we organized such a thing. You were a seventh speaker, and we have one more speaker next week. Janko, should you announce this? Yeah, uh, I think uh, the information is already out. We've got Jules uh, Retzin uh, from the UCL Bartlett and uh, Awar. Uh, joining us, and um, it's uh, it's kind of a continuation of uh, our debate with uh, Neil Leach, who uh, was opposing uh, the approach to architecture that that uh, Gilles is uh, doing, and maybe we will have some sort of um, a feedback session on on that. Uh, certainly, he is going to present his work, and uh, we'll also have a Q and A session, uh, just like we have today. So everybody is invited. Um, it will be again broadcast on Facebook, and we will be very happy to to have uh, also our previous speakers uh, present at that uh, lecture as well. It's on Monday, um, uh, six p.m. our time, which is uh, the same time as this lecture started. So um, even uh, Andrew, if you feel like joining us as well, um, uh, the next time on Monday, uh, we'll be very happy uh, to have you again, and um, maybe we could have a. Uh, a fruitful uh, debate after uh, Jill's uh, lecture.
Oh, that would be great, Jan. Please send me a link. I will. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Let's you. Give and... a chat. <laughs> <laughs> cool, Mom. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much and, and uh, enjoy your evening. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.